This is the Whole Hog Sports Football Podcast, presented by Massage Envy, featuring interviews, analysis, and feature stories on Arkansas football. Now, from Fayetteville, here's your host, Seth Campbell. The Hogs are back in action on the gridiron this week, but a daunting task awaits. Up to the Death Valley, well, for the dream, come to die. The play at Death Valley, at night, is tough enough. Then throw in Heisman hopeful Joe Burrow. Play fake to Edward Zelaer, Burrow going for all of it, caught, touchdown, Jamar Chase. Play action, Burrow going deep, and he's got Jamar Chase all the way to the floor. Burrow keeps it. Joe Burrow might be a Heisman moment right there. And there is a reason the point spread is hovering around 44 points. Can the Hogs dance in Cajun country? Or will the Razorbacks roast in Death Valley? From Whole Hog Sports, I'm Seth Campbell, and this is the Whole Hog Football Podcast. Today on the podcast, we'll highlight running back Rakeem Boyd and the great season he is having. We'll also talk to LSU beat writer Brooks Cabina about the Tigers. Then we'll wrap it up with the most experienced Razorback roundtable out there, as Bob Holt, Tom Murphy, and Scotty Bordelon talk coaching change and what went wrong for Morris at Arkansas. But first, a word from our sponsor, Massage Envy. Massage Envy has been voted the best day spa and best massage in all of Northwest Arkansas. Great therapists and estheticians go along with a new service that I am truly excited about. Rapid Tension Relief uses a special tool that will melt the tension and soreness away. Trust me, you will not be disappointed in the results. I highly recommend this feature along with a total body stretch assisted stretch program. Whether you are competing at a high level or just want to relax, these services are for everyone. Massage, Rapid Tension Relief, Total Body Stretch, deep muscle treatment massage, you choose, or you can try any combination of those. So the next time you're feeling tight, make sure to call my friends at Massage Envy. There haven't been many moments to raise the camera and flash a picture this year for the Arkansas Razorbacks football team. But chances are, if you have wanted to catch a freeze frame of the action, is because number five was involved. This is straight up the gut, and it's Boyd with a burst of speed. Outruns the defense. 76 yards. Rakeem Boyd surpassed the 1,000-yard mark for the season against Western Kentucky, despite getting just eight carries. Boyd ranks third in the SEC with 1,005 yards rushing this year. Lenny referred to Boyd as a, quote, steady force that has competed through some bumps and bruises. Boyd may have spent the majority of his time on the practice field in a green no-contact jersey, but when game day comes around, there is no boy left in Boyd. Rakeem has the opportunity to enter the draft this year, if he so chooses. Whether he stays in college or goes pro, Razorback fans need to know that number five is a must-see show. Massage Envy has been voted the best day spa and best massage in all of Northwest Arkansas. One reason is our great therapists and estheticians. Due to increased demand with our new services in both massage and skin care, Massage Envy is now looking for talented, licensed providers to join our great team. A competitive compensation package and family-like environment are just some of the reasons our providers have worked nearly 10 years with Massage Envy. Looking for a great career? Come by our clinics in Rogers or Fayetteville and apply today. WholeHogSports.com has the largest, most experienced staff of reporters covering sports in Arkansas. Football, basketball, baseball, recruiting, and more. You'll find it at WholeHogSports.com. The website includes up-to-minute news, daily commentaries, and award-winning photography from the staffs of Hogs Illustrated and the Democrat Gazette. For subscriptions, call 1-800-757-6277. That's 1-800-757-6277. Or visit us online today. WholeHogSports.com. Com. 
And of course, Coach Hatfield introduced himself as, you know, 1962 to 64 player. And I said, that's the most modest introduction in the history of Arkansas athletics. I said, this guy right here was the all-time winningest football coach and percentage-wise, obviously, in, in Arkansas football history. And to have him come out, man, now that's who I grew up watching. Interim head coach Barry Lunny Jr. after some former players came to speak to the team before the LSU game. Welcome into the Whole Hog Football Podcast. Seth Campbell joined alongside Brooks Cabina. And Brooks is a writer and a beat writer for um, that follows the LSU football team. Brooks, it's an exciting time around Baton Rouge right now. LSU ranked number one. They beat Alabama for the first time in eight years. So just what's the general feeling around Baton Rouge? Well, you know, it's 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 an exciting time. I mean, everything is on a high uh, since LSU beat Alabama for the first time since 2011. And I mean, that that was that was the um, <laughs> the thing to get over the hump for many years. And, uh, I think there was a lot of excitement uh, coming back from Alabama and seeing the fans that way, seeing it in the stores, seeing it on <laughs> just about everywhere, um, and that they knew that if LSU beat Alabama that they'd have a chance to go to the Western Division um, championship and go to the SEC championship and possibly go to the first playoff since the uh, playoff has been instituted since 2015. So, you know, everybody knows what's at stake here. And, you know, I think a lot of people are, were super excited. And the Ole Miss game was, you know, a, a big showcase of offense and the defense struggled a bit. So I think some people are a little bit um, – uh, a little concerned now about this team and if it can handle some of the top teams like Ohio State in the long run. But uh, overall, I mean, everybody everybody senses a championship as a, a distinct possibility. You mentioned the Ole Miss game, so we'll go there. With Ole Miss, you know, like you said, the defense for LSU didn't hold up as well as some people had hoped. What has Orgeron been saying this week about their defensive effort? Well, there's a lot of accountability. Ed Ogeron took some blame. Uh, you know, he, he told everyone on Monday that he believes in Dave Aranda, the defensive coordinator. He's the uh, highest paid assistant in the country at $2.5 million per year. So I think he anticipated that there would be some uh, criticism of him. And, I mean, the players themselves took ownership, one of them in particular, Jacoby Stevens, the safety for LSU. He, he said it after the game. He said it was it was just – embarrassing and on monday he reiterated the same kind of things um i, I think what uh comes down to it is you know Ole Miss is a very uh distinct offense rich rodriguez is an offensive coordinator for them who uh was the guy who who invented a lot of the stuff that you've seen in the spread offenses now i mean he was cutting edge with west virginia when he won four big east championships as a head coach and you know whenever he was at the arizona he was uh, named pac-12 coach of the year in 2014 i mean this is this is a guy who's had offensive success and they uh, had lsu's number for sure in this game and i mean john bryce Plumley, the true freshman quarterback for them is that guy is super fast and uh, he caught lsu out of position a lot of times they um lsu players have said that they ran a lot of looks and plays that they hadn't seen on tape before and uh, richard lawrence the defensive end said he you know the, the the ball would be snapped and all of a sudden he's not blocked and he wasn't expecting that so that means he's the read key and the rest of the defense is trying to adapt to that in the middle of the play and they're out of position and not ready and by the time they figured out Plum Lee, a very fast guy, is already already housing it. So they kept doing that and adjusting throughout the game. And uh, there were there were a couple other factors as well. I mean, uh, Grant Delpit, the last year was a unanimous All American at safety for LSU. Um, he, he's taken some criticism in the past couple of weeks uh, because he's been on the center of some of these big plays. And Ed Ogeron uh, made it clear that he's been playing with a, a sore ankle. We saw him get injured and banged up in the Auburn game, and there were questions whether he was even going to play against Alabama because he wasn't practicing. Uh, but the details of how bad that ankle is haven't been clear, but Ogeron said you know, you know, it, it's hindering his ability to break down, to, to run, to move. And I think you can see that pretty clearly on the last touchdown for Ole Miss where they threw a long touchdown and Delbin slides in pursuit at the end. And I think he drew a lot of criticism for that. But, um, you know, he's playing through some pain and uh, his, his teammates have been uh, giving him some support on that. But that gives you some indication about this secondary. And I think that's the undertone of this whole thing is, you know, they don't have as much depth as they uh, thought 
at the beginning of the year they might have uh, before the season began. Kelvin Joseph, who used to be a four-star recruit, uh, transferred to Kentucky. Um, Todd Harris, their free safety, was lost for the season with a knee injury against Northwestern State. Uh, you know, another uh, safety, Keenan Jones, entered the transfer portal in October. So, you know, these they, they had a ton of studs on the team entering the season. And Ed Ogeron even said it was the best defensive back unit he's ever been around. But compounded with some of the injuries and the departures and, you know, things like that, uh, Grant Delpit's had to play through pain. And so has Kerry Vincent as well. And, um, I'm you know, that's no excuse to being out of position on some of these things. Patrick Queen and uh, uh, Jacob Phillips, the inside linebackers, were uh, talking about that as well. And you know, this is this is a there were there were there were plays that they tried to get ahead of. And um, Ed Ogeron even owned up to sending a, a blitz uh, on a certain play where um, it didn't work. John Rice Blumley pulled the ball and ran down the sideline. There's no one left because everybody else had been committed to the backfield. So. Now, there was a lot of talk about these past couple of days and there are a lot of questions. And I've just given you a lot in a short period of time, but that's been the discussion for sure for a team that knows that this is important on a national championship run. No, that, that's all really good stuff. We're talking to Brooks Cabina, a writer for the advocate beat writer follows LSU. All right, Brooks, the, I guess, does this Ole Miss game serve as the wake up call for this LSU squad with two games left in the regular season? I think it lets them know how fragile this run is. Um, I think with Arkansas, you know, their new uh, quarterback changed with uh, it's, it, there's going to do some of the same kind of things that Ole Miss did. And every time an offense finds some exposure in a defense, the next opponent is going to take note and try those same things. Um, I don't know if Arkansas is the one that's going to bring down LSU, but you know, Texas a and M's the next week, and Kellen Mond is a decent runner. And I don't know if they have zone read aspects tied into their, their offense as much as Ole Miss does, but, I mean, even into the playoff run. I mean, I don't I don't think in uh, the SEC championship game that they're, they're going to see uh, much running from Jake Fromm. He's not noted to be a very speedy guy. But right. um, once you get into the playoffs, you might run into um, – you know, Dalen Hurts with Oklahoma, who's going to go over a thousand yards of rushing, or uh, if it gets to it, Ohio State. And, you know, Justin Fields is is a, is a talented runner as well. So yeah, this exposed a lot of things at a at a good time for them. And uh, you know, what's what's also notable here is that LSU's offense is so outrageously good that they can have a horrible game on defense and still win by twenty one points. You know, it's 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 pretty pretty crazy uh but they know that if they go up against another team with an equally good offense then you know and in a stouter defense that that kind of game would be a problem joe burrow has played i mean just lights out the entire year and he's as i said he's done it the entire year so it almost goes they the numbers don't stand out anymore that you're like oh that's just joe burrow doing what joe burrow does in your perspective how incredible has joe burrow been this season I mean, it's a there, there. There has not been a Heisman winner at LSU since Billy Cannon did it in 1959, and it's. I think it's going to happen with Joe Burrow. I think if you look at a lot of the uh, predicted odds, there, there's no one that close to Joe Burrow after he beat uh, after LSU beat Alabama after he won the head-to-head competition with Tua Tagovailoa, who's now out for the season with a hip injury. So you know the the path is pretty clear. Um, you know, I think. We've all had conversations about this behind the scenes, different beat writers, talking with fans. Is Joe Burrow the best quarterback in LSU history? And I think it's pretty well certain that yes, he is. Now, the bar wasn't too high. I mean, he had Jamarcus Russell uh, in 2006, a number one overall pick, and guys like Tommy Hodson and uh, guys before him. You know, it's but no one has ever gotten close to what Joe Burrow has done. And, and, and for that matter, the NCAA's history. I mean, he's, he's throwing – his completion percentage is 78%. I mean, wrap your head around that for a second. Like, 78% is just an outrageous number. Um, and it's not just, um, you know, screen passes and things like that. Uh, you know, we, Pro Football Focus College released a, a, a statistic today where 77% is his completion percentage for balls thrown downfield. I mean, this offense is perfectly suited to his needs – and it just seems like every time he's in the right position, making the right play at the right time. And, I mean, he's got 
a heck of a wide receiver core as well. But once you start digging into his past, to Ohio State, to high school, you know, you get a real good sense that this is something that he's been comfortable around his entire life. And I, you know, I wrote about that before the season began. And uh, you, you get that indication throughout the, the season and seeing what he's done. I mean, he's quite literally the best quarterback LSU has ever seen. Talking to Brooks Cabina, writer for The Advocate. Brooks, you wrote a piece, I think I saw that you wrote it last year, on Ed Orgeron and his time at Arkansas. Uh, what can you relay information-wise that you found interesting from that piece about Orgeron in Arkansas? <laughs> yeah, that was last year whenever they went up to uh, Fayetteville. And, um, you know, Ed, Ed was – he's always good for uh, a good story. Um, you know, earlier this year, Northwestern State came down and um, you know, he had some time there and I was able to do a story on that as, as well. But, you know, Arkansas was 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 really what his first gig. You know, that was that was his first big time job coming up from Northwestern State. And uh, you wonder you, you look at his contract now, and he's making millions of dollars. But at the time, you know, he's, he was given twenty five dollar checks. You know, that's, that's <laughs> not much. And, you know, he, he, he was there from 86 to 87. He actually started off as a assistant strength coach and he worked his way, uh, you know, talking, talking to coaches there about, uh, you know, can I do more? And, you know, um, Wally Ake was there at the time and uh, he, he remembers uh, him being there and he, he commanded enough respect that they allowed him to be, uh, to work with the defensive line. And, you know, that's, that's the place where, $25 every two weeks was a lot of cash at that time, you know, for Orgerod. And he lived in the dorms and he saw white gravy for the first time. I mean, this is a South Louisiana occasion that, you know, grew up on gumbo and other things. And Arkansas is not that. Um, so, I mean, he, he also earned a re reputation as a motivator, disciplinarian, you know, that kind of stuff. And he did, they, whenever he was in kind of in command of the summer camps and whenever players would pull the fire alarm, he would make them do bear crawls up those hills that, you know, by those sides. So, mm -hmm. I mean, he loved his time there and he's, he's, he's um, noted that that was the place where he learned a lot about the, the defensive line. And I think if you go through that story, I remember he learned a lot about fronts and what to use. And if I, if I remember correctly, he learned the Eagle front uh, at Arkansas. And that was, that was big for them uh, again, going against wishbone offenses and such. And you start seeing some of those same things over time. And, uh, the defenses that Ogeron has been a part of. And, you know, the main thing about Arkansas was that that's where he jumped uh, to go to Miami. So that that was the beginning of the climb for him. And, uh, you know, he, he definitely has a lot of stories from that time. I'm uh, talking to Brooks Cabina, writer for The Advocate. He follows LSU football. And before I let you go, Brooks, i got to ask you a question. This game, I mean, it technically is a trophy game. It's got the battle for the boot, which, you know, used to be played day after Thanksgiving and you know for a while it kind of went back and forth but recently Arkansas just hasn't been very good and I know that in order for a rivalry to really pick up that both teams have to be good but when these teams are good do you see this being a rivalry between the two you know um in the context of this game it's it's a difficult question to say um I, the, to me a rivalry you got to have certain things. You got to have one parity between the teams. You got to also have something at stake. And you also have to have a, a history. Now, Arkansas and LSU have a history. I mean, we remember the Miracle of Markham games in the 2000s. And, you know, there were things at stake at that time. You know, Arkansas was pushing for SEC uh, uh, championships and you know, they, they were competitive and LSU was winning and losing against them. I think, I think it was that in the 2000s, but recently there just really hasn't been that much at stake between these teams. And uh, when it's good, it's great. Uh, but at this time we're, we're witnessing one of those lulls in this. And um, you know, I, I, it's, it's just a part of football, you know, a team, a program suffers its time and, uh, the other has, has stuff, you know, has it has its goings, and uh, you know, it's 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 going to be one of those things that um, really one of the only ties between these teams that can make this a rivalry is that there's a lot of Louisiana guys on the Arkansas team. I mean, uh, they, these guys know each other, and I mean, obviously, it would be mean a lot for Arkansas to win this game, and LSU's got its sights on uh, you know an SEC championship, and they know that if they win this game on Saturday. They clinch the West. So in that capacity, they do want to win this game very badly. But, you know, it, it, and, and, 
using those definitions for me, I, I was talking the same thing about LSU and Alabama. I mean, like I said, it has to have parity. In over eight years, LSU hadn't beaten Alabama. You know, so at that point, the rivalry was a little bit one sided. Uh, mm-hmm. Alabama for a long time was like, all right, well, you know, Auburn's been the one that's beat us. Miss Ole Miss was the ones that beat us. You know, we we've got other things to worry about. And yes, LSU's the big one on our schedule, but is it a rivalry? You know, I, I think I think there's a lot of things that go into it. I think you have intense rivalries, you have trophy games, and honestly, the the best ones are are, are the ones that in the moment you know going into that game that there's something at stake and that these teams um, kind of have some shared hatred. Um, LSU and Florida definitely have that. LSU and Alabama are starting to build that. LSU and Texas A&M will have that because of last year's seven overtime game. Uh, But right now, the LSU-Arkansas rivalry is kind of on the lower end in its history. All right, that's Brooks Cabina, LSU beat writer for The Advocate. Brooks, thank you so much for joining us. Hey, absolutely, man. Anytime. And, uh, you know, have, have, have fun out there at the game. All right. Well, as I said, Brooks Cabina, he is going to be covering the LSU Arkansas game for The Advocate in a very lopsided game right now with the odds being at 44 points in favor of the Tigers. Massage Envy with clinics in Rogers and Fayetteville has been awarded Northwest Arkansas's Best Day Spa and Best Massage. One of the reasons is our care for athletes, both serious and recreational. We now offer rapid tension relief sessions using a high caliber vibrating tool and total body stretch sessions like the ones used by the PGA. Both of these new services can be combined with the always popular deep muscle treatment. So whether you compete or just want to relax, there is no place better than Massage Envy. Want more coverage of your home team? Download the Whole Hog Sports Video On Demand app. Check out the Fan Zone and get up-to-the-minute videos, podcasts, and features on football, basketball, baseball, recruiting, and more. Search for Whole Hog Sports on Apple TV, Roku, and Amazon Fire at home. And take it with you on the go by downloading it for your mobile device in your app store. The Whole Hog Sports Video On Demand app. Get it today. I don't really draw a comparison to the numbers, but man, I mean, our kids, our players, and our coaches were overdue for something good to happen to us. And it's not gonna be given to us. We're gonna have to go earn the thing. I mean, there's no way around it. Barry Lenny Jr. on the challenges of a second 0-17 record in recent memory in the SEC. Welcome into the Whole Hog Football Podcast. Seth Campbell and I'm joined alongside Scotty Bordelon, Tom Murphy, and Bob Holt. We're going to round table some questions for you. It's been a little bit since I've seen you guys, so welcome back in to the round table. And it's been a hectic few weeks, to say the least. Uh, Chad Morris has been let go of his duties. Barry Lenny Jr. named the interim head coach. And The Razorbacks went on a bye week as well. Then they get to travel to number one LSU, which is just a fantastic first game. So, you know, from you guys, I know that we, as the uh, media, you only get to see 20 minutes of a few practices a week, but you haven't really gotten to talk to anybody as player-wise yet. But we'll start with you, Scotty. How have you seen this team respond just from the little bit that you have seen in the first two weeks under Barry Lenny Jr.? I don't know. I don't know that we can get like a complete grasp of what the team's mood is like just because we only do see the, those 20 minutes. But I think it was what, last Thursday, we walked into the indoor and the managers are playing wiffle ball. And Ben Hicks walks out on the practice field and he grabs the bat and starts taking batting practice. And like, there's no music or anything like that. So in a way, I feel like they've, the mood is a little bit lightened. And Barry Lonnie even said it on Monday that he saw like the guys laughed a little bit for the first time in a long time, um, probably on Sunday at their, their team meeting, getting ready to get LSU prep started. I just think the mood is, is a little bit lighter. The guys are probably in a, in a better mood. They're refreshed, recharged, all of the all the things that Barry Lenny said on Monday. I think that's probably true. Still don't know where they are for certain from like a health standpoint because um, Kirby Adcox 
probably a question mark. He's not on the depth chart. Bumper pulled, maybe a question mark too. Barry was kind of vague on him on Monday. Um, I think just the the mood is a little bit better uh, than it than it has been in the past. Maybe uh, maybe not as tense, and uh, I'm, I'm sure the bye week did did help these guys out a lot. Yeah, I think Chad was feeling a lot of pressure. I mean, from that San Jose State game where they did not approach the field with the right mental attitude and the right plan, whatever you say that led to that loss. I think he's been really feeling the pressure and things were tight. And I was getting reports the last several weeks, even before the firing, that no one was having any fun and players were just kind of miserable. And I've heard since then from parents of players that that the mood is more relaxed, that the players are in a better, better uh, space. Um, and I, someone who was in the practices last week told me that things just looked a little bit lighter and smoother and, and they still have the same issues that they've been facing on the field, but maybe they will uh, stay in these games mentally a little bit longer, Bob. Yeah, I think it's just the, the players, they, they know what's going on with the record and the, the attendance, the fan unrest. And uh, it was just really a matter of, it would, at a certain point, it really wasn't a matter of if Chad Morris was going to be fired. It was when he was going to be fired. And so if it's inevitable, I think, like these guys said, it kind of takes pressure off everybody. Even even the assistant coaches who probably know they're going to have to look for other jobs, at least they know what's going on. The uncertainty has been removed. Everybody can relax a little bit and just kind of, hey, let it all hang out. Before we move on and talk about this team under Barry Lenny Jr. and you know the upcoming game, we'll just reflect real quick. We'll start with you, Tom. What do you believe was the ultimate downfall for Chad Morris? Well, I think it's a multi-pronged issue, and, and uh, some of it's communication. Some of it was, I think, s- some pe- people I've talked to, the coaching staff is just kind of young, especially the offensive coaching staff. And I don't know if they were teaching the players and getting them in the right positions and all that kind of thing. Um, and defensively, um, you know, John Chavis came in and said he was full of fire and gusto, but uh, they haven't been able to hold the edge. I mean, I think the defensive end position has a, had a lot to do with it. They're so young there, and losing Dorian Gerald in the first game really hurt them. So you've got you've got uh, a lack of depth in personnel uh, positions across the the board. The quarterback position you cannot undervalue how how much that has impacted this team that they couldn't get a guy on the field that was confident and could execute and be efficient in what they were doing. And, uh, you know, there was a, someone who said in the off season about Chad Morris that we don't see him unless there's some cameras rolling. And there probably was a grain of truth in that. And so I think he, there was a disconnect between him and the team and he didn't communicate very well. And they stopped wanting to quote unquote, run through a brick wall for him, wanting to play hard for him and, and that's led us to where we are today. What do you think, Bob? Yeah, I mean, obviously this team is far from the most talented in the SEC, but there was talent on here. Certainly no reason to be losing to Western Kentucky 35-7 to at halftime, you know, not even to be losing to Alabama 41 to nothing at halftime. So I just think this team consistently underachieved. Um, I think if you go back to the Colorado State game, and, and I guess that, I think that was Chad's second game, um, you know, they blew that 18-point lead, and that's something Brett Bielema's teams have done too. But I really think after that, they never really recovered from it. I mean, I know they talked about changing the culture. They had a real good fourth quarter against Colorado State and all that. But I just think this team consistently underachieved. And, and they weren't great, but they just couldn't win the games. They couldn't even win the games they, they, they should have won. I think both of y'all made some good points. And Tom, I think, kind of hit it as far as Chad being a communicator. On Mondays, I don't think he was a very effective communicator with reporters. And I think players saw that to an extent. And I think that that bled over to players also. You know, there were, I think there were some rumblings that players were, that coaches were promising or saying certain things to players that, that weren't being fulfilled. Um, and that can, that can obviously cause some unrest and I was at the, the quarterback position was has been dreadful to, to this point. The last time Arkansas's quarterbacks completed more than half of their passes was almost two months ago. Yeah. It was against Texas A&M. That's gross. And <laughs> just, 
I've said it before, like the offense was just constipated. You've got arguably one of the best backs in the league and Rakeem Boyd. If it wasn't for him breaking, you know, five 50 plus yard touchdown runs, you don't know where would this offense be without the big play from him. Um, Cheyenne O'Grady obviously gone. There was, I don't know, there was some headbutting there perhaps. Uh, and then defensively, they were just, they just been a lost cause. You said Chavis was full of gusto and whatever. It seems like he's full of gumbo <laughs> or whatever. Like it just, whatever they've done on defense, just it, it hasn't worked. Um, players thought to be kind of the headliners on defense just haven't had years that, uh, that, you know, they anticipated probably and definitely we anticipated. Um, it's just been on both sides of the ball dreadful and, um, yeah, I think it. I think it's just kind of almost as simple as that. All right. Well, that was looking back. Let's go ahead and look forward. This game against LSU. There's the odds makers aren't giving the Hogs a lot of hope. A 44 point spread. Starting with you, Bob. Do you foresee this game being as lopsided as the spread says it will be? I don't know if Arkansas is going to lose by 44 points. I think LSU can probably name their score. It's kind of like Alabama was winning 41 nothing at halftime and they ended up winning by 41. They could have won by 100. I do think that Barry Leonard's, Barry Lunny's, you know, breathed some life into this team. They're going to go out there and give a better effort and, um, you know, play hard and all that. But I just they just don't have the horses to stay with LSU. So I think it's, you know, I expect LSU to go, especially a, a night game at Tiger Stadium. I mean, this is this does not set up well for Arkansas. Yeah, I don't expect Arkansas to be in the game for, for too long. You know, Barry said that one thing they did do in the in the in the during the bye week was they kind of they kind of caught their breath and there's like a, a breath of fresh air in the program and um, maybe that can you know he he said I think at his press conference Monday before last that I lose my train of thought he he said they want to go down there and and play their best game and that they need to play with more heart I don't. I, I kind of expect Arkansas to, to, to show that a little bit early, but I don't know that they can sustain it for four quarters. I don't think any, hardly anyone in the country has, has played LSU tough for, for four quarters. Alabama did, and they still lost at home by a touchdown or two. So I, I, don't, I don't particularly see this game staying close. Joe Burrow probably have a big day, and then Clyde Edwards Hilaire will probably, you know, probably top 100 yards on the ground, and LSU's defense will probably stifle Arkansas. I, I think that point spread's about on. I don't see how Arkansas keeps LSU from scoring, you know, 50-something points. I mean, it, it would have to be uncharacteristic turnovers and things that we just haven't seen from the LSU offense so far this season. Um, I do think there'll, you know, be more life. And when you look at LSU's defense, uh, Ole Miss creased them really well. Uh, the, watching Plumlee run, that was uh, – something else last week he got to the edge about three or four different times and had some long touchdown runs and so Arkansas I think Arkansas has enough in its arsenal that they can run it some and maybe Boyd if he breaks in the secondary can go all the way as he has five other times as Scotty just mentioned and it's it's a matter of how many points Arkansas could score and I don't maybe they get in the 20s but <laughs> LSU might be in the 50s you or have no reason to believe that they can though uh, so Anyway, that's why the odds makers set the, the spreads like they do. They're pretty good at it. Yeah, they, they tend to know what they're talking about over there in Vegas in Southern Nevada. Okay, Barry Lenny Jr. has said throughout the past two weeks that he just wants the Hogs to play their best game of the year. What would have to happen against LSU for you to consider the LSU game the best, year of, the best game of the year for the Hogs? Start with you, Scotty. Just – Show show some consistency at quarterback and show that you can, you know, move the chains on third downs, sustain drives. Um, I think you've got to. In order for that to happen, Arkansas has got to show some balance too. You know, Raheem can rip off those runs, but teams are going to start loading the box to to stop him. You know, if whoever the quarterback is, and they have a direct, they feel like they have a direction that they're going to go there. So they're not going to say, but you've got to show like a downfield passing game and show that that's a, a viable option and I, I don't know I, I feel like you just got you got to stop the run some way somehow uh, maybe a, and try to somehow eliminate the the deep ball uh, in the passing game LSU's got 
obviously, I think the the front runner for the Heisman at quarterback, and they've got two of my three Bolitnikoff Award semifinalists or finalists or whatever uh, at receiver. So it's going to take a monumental effort for them to to do that. Everything Scotty said about offense, just being consistent, you know, converting some third downs, you know, uh, providing a little bit of protection, and I think. I think their plan is to start KJ Jefferson and to try to run some quarterback stuff to get to the edges because he's fast and he looked pretty good doing that against Mississippi State. Uh, defensively, tackle people, you know, don't miss so many tackles. Uh, look like you have a good idea of what the game plan is and go out there and execute it. Basically, not get embarrassed. I mean, I think that's what Arkansas fans want to see. Go down there and make a decent showing of yourself. And let's don't turn this into a route. It's going to be hard to do that. I mean, when you watch Burrow, they got a great run game. Clyde Edwards Hilaire probably has the best spin move in college football. Burrow is the highest completion percentage passer in college football. And when he's gotten pressure, he just he has an effortless glide to him that he and he throws on the run and he tucks and runs. He burned Alabama. The, the biggest plays in that game I felt were his runs in the fourth quarter against Bama, converting third down. So they've got the full arsenal and. It's been uh, it's been wild to watch LSU build to this point under Orgeron when because when he got the job, based on what we knew about him at Ole Miss and all that, can he do it? There'll be a lot more talent down there, but can he put together a coaching staff? And he's done that. What do you think, Bob? Well, if Arkansas wins, I definitely will consider that their best game of the year. <laughs> I don't I don't expect that to happen. I kind of I mean just I mean it's sad for Arkansas that it's coming to this, but not not don't be humiliated. You know, um, you know, maybe have the game be within a couple touchdowns at halftime. Uh, get some stops on defense. For, force LSU to punt a couple times. Don't give up, you know, 80-yard pass plays and 75-yard runs. And, um, you know, get some first downs. Move, move the chains. But, you know, get the, get the ball to your playmakers, those those young receivers, to where, like I said, maybe they can't stack the box totally against Boyd. But, you know, I mean, this would be just a monumental upset for the ages. I mean, it's just – I can't even imagine Arkansas winning this game. I, I, there's no scenario I can fathom where they could win this game, but I, you just don't get totally humiliated, you know. Yeah, as you said, Bob, it is sad where the Arkansas program is to where the uh, goal is to not get humiliated. All right, guys, Lenny, Barry Lenny Jr. went with three quarterbacks on the depth chart, all listed as or – with John Stephen Jones, K.J. Jefferson, and Nick Starkle being thrown back in the mix. Who do you see starting this game and being the most effective? We'll start with you, Tom. Yeah, I've already said that I think it's K.J. And to hear Ed Orgeron talk on Monday, he opened his presser by talking a little bit about the last game and then segueing into Arkansas, and he goes, their quarterback, K.J. Jefferson. <laughs> so he think, I mean – Barry Lunny wants it to be a mystery. Surprise, surprise, surprise. But Ed uh, thinks it's K.J. Jefferson. So do I. Uh, <coughs> so I think we're going to see packages for – I think Starkle might get some third down. Uh, they might run guys out in the middle of a series in this game. Who knows? But to me, the best plan of attack is to get to the edges with the quarterback and then keep them off balance with some passing. And K.J. is your man. And maybe use Starkle, maybe use John Stephen Jones in other roles. What do you think, Bob? Yeah, you look at what uh, Ole Miss gave Arkansas, you know, a bit of a, you know, plan for how you can effectively move the ball in LSU. And that Plumlee, that guy is unbelievable. Of course, he didn't even play against Arkansas, I don't believe. Mm. He was still, you know, a young guy. Well, he's still a young guy, but he, um, I mean, who knows how much he would have rushed for against Arkansas. He might have got 1,000 yards alone in that game or something. <laughs> but, um, and I don't know if K.J. Jefferson – can run like him, but but he did exploit LSU's defense, and so um, you know I think that that's a good. And I think it's, hey, what do you got to lose by? I know Barry and I respectfully said about they've got a lot to gain. He doesn't like the nothing to lose talk, but hey, give KJ Jefferson a start, uh, see what the guy can do, and, and like Tom said, I think they can have different packages for different guys and 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 rotate guys in, in and out. Obviously, Starko would be more of your passing guy. Hey, if it's third and long, put Starko in or whatever, but. Um, yeah, I think it's going to be KJ Jefferson. Yeah, I don't, I don't disagree at all. I think KJ is the the guy just because I think he's he's pretty natural reading, doing the read with the read option. I think that's kind of his bread and butter. And he's obviously he's got plenty of arm talent. Now, exactly 
is he accurate? Um, more often than not, we don't know that yet. We haven't just seen him throw it just a just a whole lot. But I figure I figure we will see Nick Starkle in this game too, because obviously those KJ and Nick have the best arms in that quarterback room. Um, I figure we'll see John Stephen Jones in there too. He he's according to Chad uh, and Joe Craddock the few weeks ago. You know he seems to make all the right reads uh, in the in the run game. Uh, so I figure we'll see all of them, but but primarily KJ and then probably more Nick than than John Stephen. All right, guys. As we wrap it up here on the roundtable portion of the Whole Hog Podcast, y'all have been around coaching searches before, and we're going to look kind of to the future now. Uh, I don't know. I don't want to name or any of that, but is Hunter Yurichek and his staff some of the most tight-lipped about the new coach that you've had the experience of working with? We'll start with you, Bob. Well, Jeff Long is pretty tight-lipped. Th- kept things pretty close to the vest. I certainly don't think uh, you know Hunter is going to tell us. Oh, here's five guys I've been in contact with their agents, or we've had them checked out by the search firm, or whatever. But yeah, in this day and age, you, you want to try to protect the candidates and. Also, you don't want people to know that your first four choices turned you down, you know, even though the guy, the guy that gets hired is always the number one choice. But, um, but back when Coach Royals was the AD, he was great because he'd come in and, you know, he, he'd ask him things and he'd confirm it or he'd say this this guy or that guy. And that, that was awesome. But those, those days, unfortunately, are long gone. <laughs> yeah, I think I don't – I figured this, this coaching search, it, it kind of has been and probably will be a lot like the – the basketball coaching search and your I think was pretty heady in the way that he, he handled that. I don't think, I think he said after Musselman got hired at that press conference that, you know, a plane never came into or left Drake field. Mm-hmm. So everybody that's watching like the, the flight trackers or whatever, were just kind of wasting their time there. And um, they didn't use a foundation owned jet or university owned jet or anything like that. So information is obviously going to be pretty tight. And then, you know, at, at at a certain point, this will gain steam, and you know, I think Wally had a had a pretty good column. I think um, Eric, Eric Musselman's hire is plenty of reason to trust your check with this with this hire. Uh, I suspect he'll you know he'll go through his list of candidates. If guys say they're out or it's not a match, he'll probably move on, and he'll he'll find his guy eventually. Well, I'm gonna talk like Ed for the rest of this teleconference. <laughs> For the rest of this podcast, no, I I like talking like Ed Orgeron. <laughs> it's fun, and uh, I remember you for that chicken on a stick you used to get in Oxford. Yeah, tell yeah, me about it, Jojo. It's nothing like gas station chicken strips. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, Scotty pointed on out something I wanted to. I thought Wally's column was dead on. That what did he call a uh, walk off grand slam? Mm-hmm. That, everything we've seen from Eric Musselman, he's plugged into. The entire basketball scene, from the AA, the amateur ranks, to the to the NBA, he knows everybody. The players are relating to him. He gives them goals. He doesn't talk about what their negatives are. He talks about the things they can do positively. Like you know, Mason Jones, he's not a natural power forward, but we need him playing the four. And here's why he's great at it. And here's why you know um, Isaiah Joe can play the point guard for us because he's he's great at these things and. I think he inspires guys, and I think Hunter Yurchek. I've been told by people who follow this stuff that when he does interviews, the, the the people that he's talking to get a good feel from him. It's a relaxed situation, and he he's just good at what he does. And so, I spent a lot of time on Sunday, and I watched videos. I know you you say you didn't want names, but I watched videos of some of the top candidates for this job. Guys, I feel like are. And they look so much more comfortable in their skin than what we've dealt with with Chad Morris. There was, there was something, the communication thing, Chad's a math major. I don't think he did well in his public speaking or his communication classes in college because it's such a primary part of what a coach has to do. And Mike Leach is in charge. He, when he does a press conference, he's very relaxed. He's drinking his coffee. He makes these offhand references, but he's a smart coach. Uh, I watched Mike Norvell, their post game from the SMU win, huge win. Game day was in Memphis. And it was just a positive energy that he exuded. exuded. I really enjoyed watching that. Lane Kiffin, I watched the post game from their big win against Florida International 
a couple of weeks ago. It's a small little table and he pulls up this chair and he was so relaxed in front of the media. He had this funny line about how, well, the Marshall game must have had a dramatic controversy landing. He goes, well, we've decided now that the officials were wrong and we won the Marshall game. Just saying that. And, and, and I love that. So um, I think Hunter Juracek in his dealings is going to get the essence of the man in, in terms of who's a great leader, who's a great communicator, who's a great coach. And it, I don't think this is a quick fix. Like Chad Moore said, it, it's not still a quick fix. But I do think they can be a lot more competitive soon. And if you build towards something, if you retain some guys on, on the current roster, you add a decent class, you should be competitive in all your non-conference games and start building towards something. It's a long road to go, uh, but I think they've got the right AD in place right now to do it. All right. Well, that was good information all the way around. Yeah. Thank you guys for joining us. And that was Scotty Borderline, Tom Murphy, and Bob Holt. You can check them out on wholehogsports.com. They'll get you ready for the LSU game. They'll get you ready for this coaching search. All kinds of good information there. And I think it's just appropriate if we let Coach Ogeron sign us out here. Go ahead, Coach. Yeah, well, we appreciate you listening to this podcast today. I'm not really in full Ed mode right now. But you come down to that game, Death Valley, Saturday night, 6 p.m., you're going to see a good football team. Out. The Whole Hog Podcast is produced and edited for Airship by me, Seth Campbell. Special shout-outs to Brooks Cabina, Tom Murphy, Bob Holt, and Scotty Bordelon. You can read more from Brooks Cabina on the Advocate website. You can read more from Scotty, Tom, and Bob on wholehogsports.com. Thank you to our sponsor, Massage Envy. By supporting them, you are supporting us. Don't forget to like and subscribe to the podcast. Subscribing and sharing is one of the best ways to let your friends know about this podcast and for us to grow. You can also comment and let us know what you like and dislike about the podcast. Theme music is by Silent Partners. I'm Seth Campbell for Whole Hog Sports. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you back here next week. Thank you.